Well, good morning and welcome to this week's online reflection. Wherever you join us from, you're most welcome. I hope that you've had a good week. My voice is a bit weaker today. Um, it's been a, a week of a heavy cold for me, um, so please accept my apologies. A couple of announcements. Blythe's with Shoebox Appeal leaflets will be available from Jennifer or um, in the vestibule of the church if you're able to fill a box this year. And if you'd like to donate towards this very worthwhile charity, we've supported this one for over 20 years, you can give a donation to Jennifer or put a marked envelope in the plate. And the cut-off date is the end of October. Advance notice that we're hoping to host a Christmas coffee morning in the halls on Saturday the 27th of November from 10 to 12 noon. And it will be organised by the fundraising committee and other volunteers and you'll hear more details about this nearer the time. But please make a note of the date. The Guild will meet on Tuesday the 12th of October. Uh, that's this coming Tuesday. And they welcome back their friend Douglas Keith, who will give a talk and slideshow entitled Holidays in Britain. Please remember to wear a mask and to bring a cup. Visitors will be made most welcome. And the Congregational Board will meet on Tuesday the 19th of October at 7.30 in the Large Hall. The increase in announcements, of course, I suppose means that we are kind of taking a few more steps forward, which is good news. Our call to worship. To the fishermen, Jesus said, follow me and I will help you fish for people. To the tax collector, Jesus said, follow me. To the rich man, Jesus said, go, sell what you own, give your money to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At the Last Supper, Jesus said, follow me. To you and to me and to all of us, Jesus says, follow me. And so let's worship God together. And George and Mara will sing the hymn, You are before me, God, you are behind. And Graham We'll read from St. Mark's Gospel and the 10th chapter.
This morning's reading is taken from Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 31, and is taken from the Good News translation. The passage is entitled, The Rich Man, starting at verse 17. As Jesus was starting on his way again, a man ran up, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to receive eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not accuse anyone falsely. Do not cheat. Respect your father and your mother. Teacher, the man said, ever since I was young, I have obeyed all these commandments. Jesus looked straight at him with love and said, you need only one thing. Go and sell all you have and give the money to the poor and you will have riches in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the man heard this, gloom spread over his face and he went away sad because he was very rich. Jesus looked around at his disciples and said to them, How hard it will be for the rich people to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were shocked at these words, but Jesus went on to say, My children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is much harder for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God than a camel to go through the eye of a needle. At this the disciples were completely amazed and asked one another, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked straight at them and answered, This is impossible for human beings, but not for God. Everything is possible for God. Then Peter spoke up, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Yes, Jesus said to them, And I tell you that those who leave home, or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or fields for me and for the gospel, will receive much more in this present age. They will receive a hundred times more houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, and persecutions as well. And in the age to come, they will receive eternal life. But many who are now first will be last, and many who are now last will be first. May God add this blessing to this reading of his holy word. I don't know about you, but I like my lists. In order for me to remember to do almost anything, I usually have to write it down on a list. I'd be lost without the list. If something's not on the list, it might not get done. And some tasks remain on the list for a very long time before I finally get around to them. And maybe some of you are like that too. We make a shopping list or a to-do list. Someone I know very well sometimes says, it's fallen off my to-do list. Life can be busy. I love my, I need my lists. And maybe you do too. In our gospel reading, the rich young ruler who asked Jesus what he had to do in order to find eternal life also apparently thought of life in terms of lists. So when the Lord told him to keep the commandments of the Old Testament, the man said that he'd checked them all off, that he'd kept them his entire life. He'd gone through the list, tick, yes, done that, tick, and that, tick, and kept that one, and so on. This is where the story becomes really interesting, for the Lord Jesus then gives him a commandment that had never been on the man's list, and that he couldn't imagine following. Sell all that you have, give to the poor, and then come, follow me. This man was rich and powerful, and he loved his possessions, so he became very sad and apparently walked away. The Lord knew how hard it was for people who have it all in this life to enter the kingdom of heaven, for they're tempted strongly to love their possessions and status more than God or their neighbour. Still, as the Lord said, to his stunned disciples, 
He said that the things which are impossible with man are possible with God. So what did he mean by speaking in this way? He certainly wasn't simply adding another law to a list of requirements to be checked off. Instead, he challenged this man to stop thinking about his relationship with God as a matter of law, as a set of behaviours, as a list which he had either to do, accomplish or master. Someone who responds to the Old Testament laws by saying, Oh, I've always followed them since I was a child, has a very shallow understanding of what God requires of us. It'd be like someone saying, Oh, I've always been a perfectly faithful Christian since childhood. The problem is it's not quite that simple. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus shows us the true meaning of God's requirements. He said that we're guilty of murder if we're angry with others if we hate others, if we insult others. And if we don't love God with every ounce of our being and our neighbours as ourselves, we've broken the greatest of the commandments. If we've any spiritual insight at all, we will see that none of us have mastered God's requirements. None of us, none of us may stand before the Lord bragging that we have it all off pat, our list complete, tick, tick, tick. The truth is, we've all fallen short, and we need God's mercy and healing in our lives. Jesus jolted this man out of his delusion, out of his false self-confidence, by giving him a commandment he knew he could not keep, giving away all his possessions, his power, his money. Perhaps for the first time, this man was challenged to see that eternal life is not a matter of checking off a list, not something that we can accomplish by our own ability. If we can't give up that which we love most in this life for God, then we obviously have not fulfilled all that the Lord expects of us. And since Christ came to unite our fallen humanity with his divinity and to conquer sin and death, it's pretty clear that even the most law-abiding person still needs the mercy, the grace, the love of our Lord in order to inherit eternal life. By our own power, it's just not possible to share in the kingdom life of heaven, but with Jesus Christ all things are possible. Maybe you've already started to make a list, another list, a Christmas list, who to send cards to, who to write to, what gifts to buy and for whom, what to order for Christmas dinner. Last week, going into the butchers in the village here, I noticed on the door the notice saying that they were taking orders for Christmas. It's that time of year again. It's list time. As we continue to prepare to celebrate the coming of Christ at Christmas, we do well to remember that this great feast is not about the birth of a mere teacher or a lawgiver or a fine example. Were our Lord simply another prophet with a strict teaching, we would not rejoice at his coming. Instead, we would, like the rich young ruler, become sad or dejected. For the last thing we need is another law to fail to obey and to make us feel guilty. Jesus was not born at Christmas to add to the burden of the law or to give us the impression that all will be well if we obey a new set of teachings. On the contrary, Jesus became a human being to do what a mere law never could do, to reach us, to bring us to him, to make us partakers of the divine nature, to heal and fulfil our humanity, to make it possible for mortals to put on immortality. Jesus was not born to bring us self-indulgence, popularity or whatever else the world calls success. Neither did he come to make us strict legalists who think that somehow holiness can be reduced to a list, a list of do's and don'ts. And he certainly didn't put on flesh in order to make his followers the self-righteous judges of others. The eternal Son of God, Jesus Christ, became one of us, one for us, one with us, for completely different reasons. Out of God's unfathomable love, he wanted to make possible for us what's impossible by our own power.
And so we prepare to receive Jesus Christ at Christmas by opening our hearts and our souls to his salvation, not by mastering laws, not by achieving something on the list, tick, 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 but by giving ourselves wholly to him, Etern inheriting eternal life, finding favour with God, being a Christian is not about lists or keeping laws or a tick box, tick box exercise. Our hearts and souls are not worthy of him. We don't serve him in every poor and suffering person. We do not seek first his kingdom. We are not perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. But unlike the rich young ruler in the gospel, we must not give up. We must not walk away in despair. Instead, we should say, Lord, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. For what is impossible with humanity is possible with the incarnation of the God-man, Jesus Christ. He is not a law. He is a person. Ian will now play a reflective piece of music. Thank you, Ian, for your reflective piece of music. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before you with reverence and awe, aware of your grace and love reaching out to us, that we, mere specks in the immensity of your creation, have not earned this privilege. Yet in your unfathomable love, you invite us to come, we are in awe of your creation in all its rich power and diversity, amazed that you offer humanity insights into its workings. Dear Lord, we acknowledge that all are welcome in your presence through the amazing love you reveal in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour. Heavenly Father, as we stumble along the way of life, help us to keep travelling along with you, secure in the knowledge that you are with us. Heavenly Father, we come to offer the thanks for the blessings that we enjoy in life. Thanks for the many seen and unseen people who contribute to our daily life. We thank you for those who grow and prepare our daily bread. We thank you for those who develop and maintain the energy supply and transport systems that we have access to. We give thanks for those who work to keep us safe, those in the armed forces and the police. Lord, we're grateful for the array of carers who help to support us, those who work to heal us, those who help us in our frailty, those who help develop medicines to fight disease. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your word, a lamp for our feet and a light for our path, and the example set by your Son, Jesus Christ. All these gifts are gifts beyond all measure, and for all this and more, we offer our humble thanks. Heavenly Father, we bring before you our loved ones. Father, you know them intimately and what their circumstances are. As we imagine now in prayer reaching out to them, may you fill them with love and offer comfort, encouragement and healing for those we bring before you. We pray for those in our community, for those who are suffering in the midst of this pandemic, from isolation, anxiety, grief for those who've suffered from COVID-19. As we visualise reaching out to them, may you fill them 
with your grace. We pray for those in our community who support those in need. Lord, you know who they are, the carers, the doctors, the nurses, and all those agencies who provide such support, which is so vital in times of need. As we imagine reaching out to them, may you fill them with an overwhelming sense of love. Lift their weariness or their frustrations and help them to persist in the midst of the challenges they face. Loving God, we pray for our world and for those who are the decision makers in the world. We pray on behalf of all those who are suffering because of world events, natural disasters, wars, climate change. We pray for those who find themselves suddenly in changed circumstances, a loss of a job, the birth of a child, the beginning of a new opportunity, those who have experienced bereavement. We pray for young people in nursery, primary school, secondary school, colleges and universities. We pray for those involved in ministry and mission, both locally, nationally and internationally. We pray for guidance for all those who make decisions in industry and government, that they would be open to the Spirit's prompting. We pray for all those who are experiencing a time of illness, financial hardship, or who suffer from addiction. We pray for those who are suffering persecution because of their commitment to you, O Lord. Hear all our prayers in the name of Jesus, who taught us when we pray to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us and tuning in again today. It's been lovely to have you worshipping with us. And I want to express thanks on your behalf to all who took part in this reflection. To George and Myra for the hymn, to Graham for the reading, to Ian for his reflective piece, and to Alan and Emma for putting it all together. Until next week, take care, stay safe, and know that whatever you face, God is with you. <laughs>